The first lesson is found in the book of Isaiah, chapter 66, beginning with verse 1. Thus says the Lord, Heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. What is the house that you would build for me, and what is the place of my rest? All these things my hand has made, and so all these things came to be, declares the Lord. But this is the one whom I will look. He who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, the second lesson this morning is found in the book of First Chronicles, chapter 16, beginning with verse 23. We'll be reading this uh, responsibly, so please follow along on the screens. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and he is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are worthless idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and joy are in his place. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. The word of the Lord. The third lesson is found in the book of Matthew, chapter 2, beginning of verse 1. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand for the Holy Gospel. Our gospel reading this morning comes from John's Gospel, chapter 12, beginning with verse 1. Glory to you, O Lord. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served, while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume, she poured it out on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of the disciples, G Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. You may be seated. Let's pray. Ah, dear Father, you are our almighty God. Jesus, you are our Savior, and you deserve all of our praise. And so, as we turn our attention toward you, as we turn our attention toward your truth, we ask that you would send your Holy Spirit to be in this place, and we know that he is, so help him give us the ability to bring our hearts to you, King Jesus, as a gift, for it is your mercy that endures forever. And so, Holy Spirit, just come and take me out of your way, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Last week, uh, Pastor Jeff reminded us that he had heard a word of the Lord for our congregation. 
the word that he heard was he, that is God, he is ready, ready to catch us, but we need to jump. And as Pastor Jeff continued to pray over this word that he had heard, Pastor Jeff said that he felt God's desire for Good Shepherd was for us to enter a season of revival, a season of prayer, a season of praise, a season of worshiping and surrendering to our God who comes week after week, week to strengthen us, to encourage us, to call us to be still and to know that he indeed is God. And we are in that season of revival, that season of prayer and praise and surrender. We are in that season to praise our God, not just any God, but our Lord God Almighty, who is the creator of the heavens and the earth. He is the Lord of lords. He's the King of kings. And he indeed is worthy of our praise. He is our God. And he desires to come week after week and help us be revived and help us be renewed and help us be made fresh. He is our God and he comes week after week and he desires for the Holy Spirit to be here in this place when we worship so that we can be prepared to take that deep breath that he told us to take because we are indeed going to jump into this new vision that God has given us. And today, as we continue to talk about this season of revival, as we walk hand in hand with the Lord, he has asked us to not just take a deep breath today, but to turn our attention to what does it really mean to praise our God. In so doing, we thank the Holy Spirit ahead of time for opening up our hearts and for giving us the ability to understand how to praise our Lord. You know, if you look at Webster's Dictionary, you will find that it defines praise as admiring or commending or extolling or honoring or worshiping someone or something. It leaves that interpretation up to us. But if you look in the Bible, the someone or the something is our God alone. He is the one that is rightly due our act of praise, our act of joyfully thanking and adoring him, our God, in celebration of his goodness and in celebration of his grace. The Bible clearly expresses the importance of praising God, and the reasons for doing so are countless. If you look up the word praise, you will find that it is mentioned 248 times in this beautiful love story. 130 of those words are found in the book of Psalms. No wonder. It is a book of helping us praise God. Also, in the Old Testament, there are seven different Hebrew words to describe what it means to praise God. Those words paint this beautiful picture of God's people boasting foolishly and making a public spectacle of themselves in their praising of Almighty God. These words, these seven Hebrew words, paint a picture of God's people shouting as they throw their arms upward toward our God and reaching out into his direction. When we do that, these words tell us that we offer ourselves in total surrender to Jesus as we confess deeply that we have a need for Jesus to come. We have a longing in our heart for him to come and to set us free. The Bible encourages us to sing praises together as a community, to come week after week as the people of God, and to shout things like, hallelujah, how great is our God. To shout, hallelujah, he is worthy of our praise. Psalm 66, 3 reminds us that God's steadfast love is better than life. So our lips should praise him in all circumstances. That means that we praise him in the good and we praise him in the bad. We praise him in our joys and we praise him in our sorrows. We praise him when we're celebrating and we enter into praising him in the midst of the storm, much like Silas and Paul when they were um, arrested and beaten and thrown in prison for preaching the gospel. You can find that story in Acts chapter 16. And when you read it, you'll find that after they were beaten for proclaiming Christ crucified, They were thrown into a dark dungeon, and in that darkness, in the agony of their pain of being whipped, in those 
circumstances, Paul and Silas at midnight were singing psalms and they were praying and they were worshiping and they were praising God. And in the middle of all of that, God came and miraculously set them free. And he did it in such a way that it wasn't just Paul and Silas that were set free. But if you remember, the jailer and his entire family come to know Christ and are saved. Praising God is powerful. The Bible tells us that praising God is useful for us. When we praise God, we are reminded of his greatness. We're reminded of his power. We're reminded of his very presence in our lives. Psalm 135 tells us, praise the Lord for the Lord is good. Singing to his name is pleasant for us. So what motivates you? What motivates me? What motivates us to come and to praise God? And a question that I have for you this morning is when you come into these worship services, when you come into this place that we say is the house of God, this room specifically, do you come with an anticipation and expectance that you will actually have an encounter with Jesus? I ask that because in this season that the Holy Spirit has called us into, in this season of prayer, we at Good Shepherd are his people. And we need to be in this time of prayer because it is God who has called us to turn our eyes upward toward him and be deliberate in seeking him. That means that we should anticipate and expect him to show up. If this is his house, we should expect him to be here. But I wonder if we fully understand what that means and what this new season is. And do we understand fully that we cannot step into we, this new season? We can't take that leap of faith on our own. We shouldn't leap into this new season, this new vision without the Holy Spirit. It's through him. It's through his power and the directing of the Holy Spirit that we go. We join together in petition of the Lord, and we should ask, give us your discernment. Give us your wisdom, Jesus. Tell us not just where we're going, but how are we going to get there? So we come here, and we worship him, and we praise him, not just to take a deep breath, not just to rest and abide in Jesus, but we come here to get right with God. It's one of the reasons that we start our worship services week after week with a time of contemplation and a time of confession so that we can get right with him because getting right with God is a prerequisite for hearing God. Getting right with him is a way for us to be in, to get us in a state where we can praise him and we can worship him. When we come to get right with God, who has invited us into his house, into the very holy of holies, into the very presence of King Jesus, we do so expecting a personal encounter. So how many of us have come today to this worship service, not just to praise him, but to give him a gift? A gift of our hearts, a gift of our minds, a gift of our souls, a gift of everything that is within us, for that is what he desires. You know, I have to confess that I had a whole different sermon written until partway through this week, Pastor Jeff sent me a video of a pastor who was preaching on what it looks like to praise God. And when I watched that sermon... It was unlike anything that I had heard before, and so I needed to dig deep. What is this new thing that you have brought to me this week when I'm going to be preaching on praising you? And so many afternoons, I closed my door, and I thought, okay, if I stand here in my office and I turn on the praise music, nobody's going to see me dancing. <laughs> nobody's going to see me making a public spectacle of myself if I'm doing it in private. And so that's what I did for hours I just listened to this praise music and I prayed. I got down on my knees and I said, what is it? What is it about praising you? What, what do you mean give a gift? Because aren't we supposed to come here expecting Jesus 
to do something for us? Don't we come here expecting him to minister to us, to heal us, to talk to us, to restore us, to encourage us? And all of those things happen, and those things are really good. In fact, those things happen in exchange for us coming and worshiping him and giving him the gift of our hearts and giving him the gift of ourselves. The preacher in the video started with Isaiah 66, verses 1 and 2, which we read earlier. In those verses, God reminded his people of who he was, that he was the almighty God, that he had created all things. And after he had set up who I am and who you are, he got, he got everything right. He said, but this is the one to whom I will look, he who is humble and contrite in spirit and who trembles at my word. But this is the one to whom I will look. Have you come this morning with an understanding that at some point in this worship service, the Lord is going to turn his face toward you? You know, week after week, we say this, right? May the Lord make his face shine upon you. May he be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Why would we not expect him to not look at us? I mean, wouldn't, he's not going to look somewhere else if we are his people and we are the ones that are praising him. We should anticipate that at some point he's going to turn his face upon us. What are we going to do in that moment when we realize that the Lord, King Jesus, is looking at us? Are we prepared for that conversation? You know, when we come into the presence of a king, we should bring a gift, right? Not just the Bible, but history shows that. If you remember when King she or King Sheba, when Queen Sheba came before King Solomon, the Bible just lists word after word after word of these gifts, these awesome gifts that she brought now she's a queen so she can lavish him with all of these things in our gospel reading of matthew the magi spent two years traveling from the east to to, to uh, bethlehem two years and when they got there they were overjoyed with the fact that the star had brought them to where jesus was and what did they do when they came into the presence of king jesus this two-year-old baby they knelt down before him, they humbled themselves before him, and they gave him the gift of gold and frankincense and myrrh. It's an example of what we are supposed to do when we come into the presence of our king. We give him a gift, but you and I know that we don't have a gift worthy of Jesus. King Jesus is our Lord and Savior who stepped out of heaven for us. He came because his father loved the world so much that he sent Jesus, his one and only son, so that whoever comes to believe in him would not perish but would be given eternal life. So what gift do we, come, do we bring when we come into the presence of King Jesus? King Jesus, who in cooperation with the Father and the Holy Spirit, suffered the torture of being whipped and the agony of the unthinkable pain of his death as he hung on the cross and he died for us so that he could take away the sins of the world. What gift do we bring when we come into the presence of King Jesus who was raised from the dead on the third day as God kept his promise to restore all that was broken when sin entered into God's creation? Knowing that we're supposed to bring a gift because we're coming in front of King Jesus and knowing that we really have nothing that's worthy to give to him, what do we bring? Well, the Bible says we bring ourselves. We bring the good, the bad, the ugly, everything that is about us. We bring it. Isaiah says we bring a humble heart, a contrite spirit, and we come trembling before our Lord. Not because he, we think that he's a mean, angry God and we're scared of him. No, we come trembling before him because we come into the presence of, our, of the holiness of God. So we bring us. You bring you. I bring me. We bring his people. 
The Bible tells us God's in, original intention was for us to be in his presence. Remember, Adam and Eve walked with him daily in the cool of the day. It was God's intention to have that kind of relationship with us, to walk and talk daily with us, to be side by side, hand in hand with him as he teaches us what it means to be made in his image. So when Isaiah tells us that God looks upon us, we should understand that Jesus has come to invite us to open up our hearts through the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus is inviting us to give the gift of our heart to him as the Holy Spirit gives us the gift of hungering and thirsting after Jesus. We come into the presence of King Jesus and we give him the gift of ourselves because the Holy Spirit puts a desire inside of us to have our hearts worship and praise our Lord. To me, there's no more beautiful illustration of someone completely, utterly surrendering themselves in praise and worship to Jesus than the story of the woman who brings her alabaster box. This story is found in Matthew and Mark and in John. In Matthew and Mark, it talks specifically about the fact that she brings an alabaster box or some trans most translations say alabaster jar. She brings it on the last week of Jesus' life when he's staying in the town of Bethany with his friends Lazarus and Mary and Martha. Remember, Lazarus is the one that he's raised from the dead. While he's there in their home, a man named Simon the leper throws a dinner party for Jesus. And all of the regular characters are there. The disciples are there. Lazarus is reclining with Jesus at the table. Martha's doing what Martha does best. She's serving, John says. And Mary is doing what Mary does best. She's abiding in the presence of her Lord as she listens to him, as she's worshiping and praising him. You know, John doesn't tell us exactly what caught Mary's attention, but something must have. For in the middle of the dinner, she picks up this box, this jar, and she does the unthinkable. She gives her entire heart, she gives her entire most precious expensive gift over to Jesus. And she does it in a sign of complete and total praise to her Lord through her love. We can imagine that the room would have grown still after the men would have gasped that she dared to come. She dared to come, and I wonder if her eyes were filled with tears, knowing what she was about to do. For in her arms, she brought her alabaster box, filled with a pint of pure nard, which is a very expensive oil. It was probably her wedding dowry that she brought. And with it, she anointed his entire body from head to toe. She took what was most costly, the great sum of her wealth, and she lavishly spent it upon Jesus as a sure sign of her great love for him. Not only did she pour this great amount of oil upon him, but she once more takes her place at his feet. The same place where she had been so many times when she sat listening to the words that fell from his lips as she grew in a knowledge of her Lord. And then she breaks all the rules. She lets down her hair. She uses it to wipe his soon-to-be-crucified feet. She takes her hair and she wraps it up and makes a towel to wipe Jesus' soon-to-be-crucified feet. In that moment of pure surrender, she bundled up everything that was precious to her, even her own honor, and she presented it as a gift to Jesus in praise and adoration of the surpassing worth of knowing that Jesus Christ was her Savior. But it wasn't just the cost of the perfume that made this a sacred moment. God had created this moment. He knew, and the Father knew in advance that 
Mary would be there at this dinner table and she would bring this oil to pour it over our Lord in preparation for his burial. This was a sacred moment for in her coming, Mary poured out her love and her praise and her oil upon our Lord Jesus. And she came because only Mary knew the cost that Jesus had paid to wipe away her own sins. Only Jesus knew the cost of what it would, he would pay as he would hang on the cross and die for her. Only Mary would know what it would take, what the cost of the oil would mean, because she had been in the presence of Jesus when he had wiped away her tears and her brokenness and her sins as he had thrown his arms around her, as he had pronounced her forgiven, as he had healed her soul with the wonder of his touch. Yes, Mary broke all the rules. And her love for Jesus was shown in the whole self-offering of her life that was so richly described in John's telling of that the entire house, not one corner of that house, was unfilled with the fragrance of her gift. The entire house. I wonder, when you and I come into this place that we call the house of God, when we give him our praise, when we give him the gift of our heart, when we give him the gift of our worship, when we give him the gift of our love, does the sweet fragrance of our praise Fill this place, every corner, every nook, every cranny of this place, is it filled with the sweet smell and fragrance of our worship and our praise to God? I hope so, because that's what God intends it to be. I have asked Barb to sing a song that is dear to my heart. It's a song about Mary's alabaster box. And as she sings it, I invite us to bow our heads and bow our hearts and bow our knees before our Lord Jesus and just spend some time in his presence. And I pray that we can bundle up our hearts and lay them at his feet and ask him to accept our gift, the gift of our worship and the gift of our praise.